So, um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the University of Sheffield Translational Energy Research Center and our webinar on accelerating hydrogen. My name's Stuart Dawson, and I'll be co-hosting this event with Paul Pereira from Vassal Enterprises. So thank you very much for joining us today. Over the next two days, we're gonna be hearing from leaders from right across the hydrogen sector about what their organizations are doing to help accelerate the transition towards hydrogen as a means to decarbonize our heating, our transport, and our most difficult to abate industrial processes. And of course, one of the great promises of hydrogen is not just about decarbonizing our energy, but also to provide grid scale storage to help us mitigate the intermittency of renewables. And of course, that's particularly uh, topical at the moment, because as you're probably aware, uh, in UK and Europe, we're currently experiencing record high energy prices for electricity and, and gas. And that's due to a, a perfect storm of factors. But one of them is that uh, the output from our offshore wind has been about 75% below its usual output. So even though uh, hydrogen offers this great opportunity um, to decarbonize our energy and provide grid scale storage, there's still many significant technical, uh, economic and political challenges to overcome before we can transition to a true hydrogen economy. And not least of these is the fact that uh, hydrogen co currently costs a lot more than the incumbent fossil fuels such as natural gas, diesel, petrol and kerosene. Another significant issue is the conundrum between how to properly balance both supply and demand simultaneously. And what can government policy do to help stimulate that? On a positive note, uh, one really significant milestone was that in August, the UK published its first hydrogen strategy. It's very welcome, of course, because it clearly signals to industry the government's intent to support the sector, and this will hopefully provide confidence to, to investors. But does it go far enough? For example, does the strategy properly balance the incentives between both supply and demand? The energy strategy plans to stimulate up to five gigawatts of hydrogen capacity by 2030 using the contract for difference mechanism that proved so successful in stimulating the growth for the offshore wind sector over the last decade. But where are the similar policies to help stimulate the equivalent level of demand because you need both supply and demand? And is it right that the strategy also is focused on fuel switching of domestic heating, when that could probably be better achieved via electrification and when there's highly emitting heavy industrial processes that can only actually be uh, abated via hydrogen? Less controversially, I think all manufacturers will welcome the strategy's ambition to not just incentivize production, but also to maximize the economic opportunities of, of developing indigenous uh, UK manufacturing supply chain for the technologies, the products, and the infrastructure that's gonna be necessary to underpin a successful hydrogen economy. So Paul and I are absolutely delighted that we've got so many industry leaders joining us over the next two days to tell us exactly what their companies are doing to accelerate the transition towards a hydrogen economy and what we need to do to overcome the key technical, economic, and political issues that need addressing. On the supply side, we're going to be hearing from Proteum, ITM Power, Equinor, EDF, and Octopus Energy about what they're doing to pioneer the production of green, blue, and pink hydrogen. Now, uh, you, I guess most of you are all going to be familiar with green and blue, perhaps not so much pink. So I'd better just quickly explain that. So pink is uh, hydrogen that's produced via electrolysis, uh, electrolysis, but where the energy to do so is provided by nuclear energy. And tomorrow we'll be hearing from the Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Center um, about th these new uh, hydrogen cogeneration technologies that can offer low cost baseload hydrogen production at very high efficiencies because they, uh, they perform the electrolysis on the high temperature waste steam. In terms of key hydrogen enabling technologies such as fuel cells and fuel cell compressors, we'll be hearing from leaders in the industry such as Johnson Matthey, Aristec and Waygate Technologies. 
On day two, we're going to be focusing on decarbonisation of transport and the refuelling infrastructure that's necessary to support it. For decarbonisation of flight, we're going to be hearing from Airbus about their three new concept aircraft. And from Cranfield Aerospace Solutions, we're going to be hearing about their new project Fresson zero emissions uh, aircraft, which is powered by hydrogen fuel cells. We're also going to be hearing from High Point, and they'll be telling us about their very high power to weight ratio fuel cell that's been specifically developed to meet the demands of aerospace applications. On the refueling and infrastructure side, we'll be hearing from Deuce and Babcock. ATI will be telling us about all the different options there are to, uh, to, to enable hydrogen enabled airports. Um, we'll be hearing from Universal Hydrogen. They'll be telling us about their innovative new concept for hydrogen refueling capsules. And then finally, we'll be hearing from ITM Motive about their hydrogen refueling stations for ground-based transport. So in terms of uh, industry, uh, assisting industry in, in, in to develop and functionally test um, the hydrogen-powered equipment, I'm very pleased to be speaking to you today from the University of Sheffield Translational Energy Research Centre. In a few minutes, we'll be hearing from Professor Porkashanian, who is the uh, head of the university's Energy Institute and also the director of the, this Translational Research Centre. And he'll be, uh, amongst many other things, telling us exactly what this centre capabilities uh, are to help um, assist um, industry in developing new hydrogen technologies. Um, those include uh, carbon capture, industrial scale or pilot scale uh, carbon capture, hydrogen fuel cell testing, hydrogen combustion testing, and also development of sustainable aviation fuels. So a very interesting lineup of speakers from right across the hydrogen sector. At the end of each of the presentations, there'll be short Q&A sessions. Um, if you can post your questions in the chat, uh, Paul and I will read the, the questions and put them to the speakers at the end of their presentations. We won't be distributing the presentations at the end of, of this webinar, but there will be links available to review these at a later date. So um, before we begin then, I'd like to introduce you to my co-host and event moderator, Paul Pereira from Vassal Enterprises. Paul is a very prominent thought leader in the field of hydrogen and he's held a number of senior industry positions, including uh, uh, Director of Strategy and Future Defence Programmes at Rolls-Royce, and most recently, Vice President of Technology at GK and Aerospace. And for many years now, Paul has been a very passionate proponent of hydrogen as a means to decarbonise aerospace propulsion. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll hand you over to Paul. Thank you. So thank you, Stuart, and, and thank you for the audience that's assembled. And we've got a, a fantastic audience from across the world, um, as well as a number of speakers from across the world. So this platform is really here today to help us elevate and accelerate hydrogen. And why is it it's such a passion to me and the people that we're going to meet? Um, because we believe in climate change is really happening and we're seeing it happening faster and faster. So what do we need to do? We need to come up with solutions that meet the needs to reduce the fossil fuel consumption that we all have. And we're in this great big building here at the University of Sheffield, where we're going to be joined in a moment by Professor Pokoshanian. I just wanted to explain how the platform works because it may not be familiar to all of you. It's a relatively innovative platform and therefore has its quirks. And we love to uh, explain how to make it simple for you. So we have sessions. Each session is divided into time slots, which are as per the agenda. And we're looking forward for each of you to join us as many of those slots as you can. But as it's also recorded, if you happen to miss one, you can come back later and watch it as a result of the way that we're running these sessions. We really hope that you will dip in and stay on and, uh, and join us for the conversation. Because one of the things we believe passionately about is nobody can solve the challenges of climate change alone. We have to collaborate. And with that, please do ask questions, as Stuart's already explained. There's a Q&A panel, and I can see a few people already beginning to use that, which is great. Um, but please do also converse with each other. There's an ability to do that in some of the breaks. Um, and without further ado, um, you know, I'm going to tell you to join us in the next part of the panel. So we basically go to the 
um, left-hand side who will um, choose to get to the next part of the conference, and I will there introduce you to Professor Paul Koshanian. So move to the little flashing one uh, with the conference and then um, join us in the next session. Thank you.